Okay, so welcome to Social AO3 week six of semester two, or week 16 of the entire full year class. Um, today, so lots of reasons to be happy. Um, I'm gonna try to end the lecture early, um, but you're staying the whole time, if you want, because we're having the amazing uh, uh, Ujwal and Sarah coming in to do, um, you know, many of you asked for a study guide, um, so we have a kind of interactive study guide. Um, it, it will be posted on Quercus at the end, and we'll be writing notes um, during, so any questions that you have will kind of be built into the study guide as we go. Um, so I'm going to try to wrap up on my end at 3.30, um, uh, and, and then let them go. Um, so, so I'll be a little bit quicker than usual. Um, we may have to unfortunately skip one of our study buddy videos. Um, but we definitely will not, or, or sorry, study buddy activities. Uh, but we definitely will not be skipping uh, the weekly sneak preview of the latest study video. Uh, I can't skip the study video the week, well, the test is February 27th, but this is our last class. Um, before then, so uh, I'll give you a little taste of, of that video and then what's to come, um, and I'll poll you on that. Um, just as a note, I'm sure this person thinks they're very funny, it probably wasn't the real person, but someone left a note at the front here saying, please get another square mic from the mic thief. So, funny, I ha now I have that on video, so joke's on you because I'm actually a, a handwriting expert, so no, I'm not. But, but um, Maybe someone, you know, when this, when this class goes viral, um, so here's to you, uh, whatever writing expert creeper that watches the Socio 3 video, you can capture our thief. Um, they won't be punished, it's funny, so it's fine. Um, okay, so just a couple of announcements. You'll see a couple of announcements were made this week. Uh, so I will be having uh, another set, sorry for the short notice, but um, not many of you have emailed me about this, so, um, you know, if, if you can't make this session, um, then we'll figure something out. Uh, but uh, I will be having uh, office hours tomorrow from 2.30 uh, to 4 p.m. in my office, HL482, um, if you still want to review test number one. Um, I'm going to be having office hours for a big chunk of the day on February 27th, so you can also look at it on that day as well if this doesn't work. Um, but I likely won't be on campus um, the Monday or the Tuesday before the test. Um, but uh, I'll see, because the, the, uh, we don't have lectures. Um, so just as a reminder, we, don't, uh, we, we do have tutorials this week. So this week, think of it really as your test prep. So we have the kind of interactive study guide in here today. And then your tutorials are totally geared towards test two. Um, and then we have no lectures until the test. So remember, because the, the, whenever a test is held outside of class time in Socio 3, we cancel the lectures. Um, so your next lecture is not until the beginning of March. Um, so you know, you, you'll, have to, you'll have to watch your, uh, your study videos to, to get your fill of Lawrence. Um, OK. So, the office hours are again tomorrow, 2.30 to 4, some extra ones. Um, and then TA office hours, uh, if you want to go over, if you have any questions about assignment number two. Um, I'll just make this a bit bigger up here. Again, these are just announcements that you can see at your leisure. Um, so Julia, not all of them have office hours, um, but you, know, you can arrange something with them uh, by talking to them uh, after tutorials this week, um, if, you, if you really, you know, you can always, you can always ask for th things about your essays by email also. Um, so if you do want to see them in person, Julia is there from 12 to 1 um, on, uh, on Wednesday, this Wednesday, Shelby this Friday from 1 to 2 in MW324. Um, and, then if you're sp and, and then if you have an academic integrity review issue, um, you can talk to Jason on Friday. Um, so, again, if you wanted to talk to House and Patricia or Anson about your essay, um, I would email them. Uh, again, they just, uh, they weren't available that week, or this week. Okay, so now we get cracking on our weekly topic. Um, so, Again, I apologize, there's lots of things to be fit in, and, and we are sh uh, we're, we're tightening this week as it is, we're shortening it. Um, but as you noticed, you know, the we're, we're, 
We really don't want anyone leaving Social AO3 without little tastes of everything sociology has to offer. Um, so health, aging, and disabilities could all be three separate weeks, um, but this course and the textbook alike have lumped them together um, because they do have a lot of common themes. Um, so just like last week, how we looked at crime, law, and regulation, again, not only three topics and three subfields of sociology, but could easily be three courses. Um, this week has some themes that could be quite different, but we're putting together for sake of time. Um, so this lecture, I will emphasize the theoretical commonalities, um, the shared ways uh, that namely uh, functionalists, uh, conflict theorists, and symbolic actionists, symbolic interactionists, the shared ways they frame, the, the shared and different ways they frame these three issues. Um, and again, just like every other topic we look at, the, the goal is, as all of you surely are budding and excited sociologists, um, the question and the take home is, how do I view this topic as a sociologist? How do I exercise my sociological imagination towards this topic? Um, so, before we get started with the study of health, aging, and disabilities, it makes sense first to just get started with health. Um, you'll see all three of these topics will be centered around the broad definition um, and perspective of health. Um, so, according to the World Health Organization, the WHO, um, health is, quote, the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Um, so, the latter part of that definition is very important. Um, so health, you know, we all have a, I think, a pretty clear sense of what health is and what it means to be healthy. Um, typically when you think of being healthy, it means not being sick, right? It's kind of one of those negative definitions. Um, so that means, you know, not being, not suffering from acute, like sudden major pain or chronic pain. Um, having, you know, uh, good mental health means that you're not uh, suffering from depression or anxiety uh, or personality disorders or other things. You're not grieving uh, for any long period of time. Um, but the WHO has more, has shifted away from this negative view of health and onto a more holistic or positive view of health. Um, so when we get to the discussion of alternative health care, um, something I can speak to personally, which I will at that point, uh, we'll see how this definition as a sociologist, this change towards a more positive, broader view of health um, has really become important um, in, in the recent time. Um, again, so think, you know, I always try to bring in some historical perspective into my lectures. Um, so the WHO marks a turn, again, in the, de in the defining of health as not being sick to now really having well-being. Uh, and we'll see kind of what constitutes well-being and how different sociologists have framed this idea of well-being. Um, so the broadening of the term of health from just not being sick or not suffering and into um, having social well-being, mental well-being, physical well-being, uh, lends itself to seeing that health is impacted by many of the same factors that other aspects of our lives are impacted by. Um, so again, the same way that we study, say, how crime is impacted by gender and race and age um, and income levels, um, and you know, gender is impacted by uh, and impacts income levels and all of those factors. We see all these different factors in social life kind of intersect. Um, by, by taking away the negative definition of health as just not being sick, we now are able to analyze, okay, we've said, let's, for, for example, men and women um, and people of different uh, racial backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds are treated differently in school, are treated differently in the courts, are treated differently by police officers, whatever the example is. We now can ask, okay, do these groups experience different health outcomes? Um, so the chapter kind of opens up right away by saying, well, yes, we can. Um, income or SES, minority status, and gender all relate very intimately with health. Um, so 
people's life expectancies, the odds of them suffering from chronic pain, the odds of them reporting uh, mental illness or mental unhealth is very gendered. Again, women report those things much more than men do. Um, we'll see there's multiple explanations for why that is. Um, but so long, long story short, um, by opening up the definition of health, we now can treat it as one other factor um, in all of the different kind of social factors that we study as sociologists. Um, okay, then I don't have to get so much in the, uh, basically again, life expectancy is something, uh, when you're looking at health across populations, life expectant and over time, so within a country over time, life expectancy is often one of the first measures that people use to assess um, a population's health. So you can kind of just think of the contemporary West and say, you know, hundreds of years ago, the lifespan was, you know, 30 or 40 years of age. People died during, women often died during childbirth. Children often died during childbirth, their own birth. Um, and now the average life expectancy is around mid 80s. Um, so that's a kind of rough barometer. Life expectancy is often used to compare countries and again, countries um, historically. Um, so again, just the examples I gave, um, just focusing here on, on uh, income or socioeconomic status and minority status. Again, whether you are um, a visible minority or non-majority person. Um, so low income individuals are almost, or are about three times as likely to self-report um, meaning, you know, on a survey or in an interview, they say they are experiencing negative health symptoms or they don't feel their well-being is very high in terms of their physical or mental or emotional health um, than individuals who uh, are not low income. Um, and then minority status, uh, it's more complicated, obviously, because, you know, even though visible minorities are often uh, put into one category, every minority is different um, in terms of their experiences with the world, right? They're not all, you know, being a minority person doesn't just mean you're non-white, you are whatever ethnicity you are, uh, you're part of a different community, um, you, you uh, have access to different resources. So all of those things are very variable. Um, but on average, minority individuals do experience more health problems um, than non-minority uh, individuals in Canada. Um, and that's a trend that's uh, established in many parts around the world too. Um, and then in terms of gender, again, we'll see that the, uh, the uh, self-reporting, again, people coming out and saying, hey, I'm suffering from depression um, or some other sort of mental ailment, um, that's more likely in women than in men. But ironically, um, suicide is much more frequent among men than women in most age demographics. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of link that up with the idea of um, emphasized femininity and hegemonic masculinity. Um, and I think it's a good time to do that too, uh, just because I'm sure as you know, you're all connected Gen Zers or whatever, um, there's been a lot of media campaigns around uh, and, and uh, excitement around the term toxic masculinity, you know, those Gillette ads and stuff. So you can talk about that. Uh, when we get to that point of the class. Um, okay, so that's the kind of broad, in, uh, broad again, just to remember for the arc of the class, um, the, we always have those binaries. So the kind of study of health as not being sick has now shifted to seeing, let's see health as this broader category um, that's impacted by all the other sorts of factors that, that um, social life mainly your income, your race, your gender, your work, uh, prestige, stereotypes, all of these things influence health, which make health, yes, of course, biological and based on your own perception of your health and all of that, but also fundamentally social. So it's another kind of variable that sociologists analyze. Uh, and the sociology of health, again, a, a course I taught in the past, last summer, um, was the sociology of mental health. Um, and, you know, there I, I, I looked at things like depression, schizophrenia, um, suicidal ideation, and I was trying to teach the class, you know, um, 
how have these things changed over time, how might a sociologist analyze these issues, to what extent are these uh, biological or nurtured into people. Um, these, these are the sort of questions sociologists ask when they're kind of focused on health. Um, so in health in Canada, um, our, you know, we, we had a similar discussion uh, or of looking at principles when we were looking at immigration and minority status. Um, again, Canada is known globally for its, uh, not just for being multicultural, probably two of the biggest things we're known for are one, being multicultural, but then also having what's called um, you know, universal healthcare. Um, so our ca uh, Canadian healthcare is based on five principles. Um, so you, that it's universal, accessible, comprehensive, portable, and publicly administered. So what does that mean? Uh, well, they're all pretty self-evident. So universal health, health care means every single Canadian, whether they pay taxes or not, um, so home, individuals suffering from homelessness, um, they should all be able to get health care. Um, linked to that idea is health care being accessible. Um, as we'll see, that is one of the biggest issues. So there's one thing to say, yes, I have access technically on paper to healthcare, meaning you know I can get a, a health card regardless of what my income is. Um, you know, based on what your income is, you'll be paying more or less uh, through your taxes. Or if you're not working at all, you won't be paying anything right away. Um, but it's one thing to say that I have theoretical access to healthcare, but it's another to say, okay, um, can I afford to see the doctor even though it's quote unquote free? So. Is there a doctor's office located near where I live? Um, are there doctors around me that work in the evenings or the weekends? So if I'm a single mom, um, imagine, and I'm working roughly, you know, 8 to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday to Friday or something, and I'm living in a neighborhood where the closest physician's over an hour away, I can't get to them by public transit, um, how accessible is that to me? versus someone in another neighborhood with a more flexible schedule who has uh, tons of doctors around that are very flexible. Um, so, so that's what's meant by the kind of accessibility issue of healthcare. Um, so again, according to this, there's, there should be no discrimination. Um, so that, I think, most, you know, most of us would expect no overt discrimination. So doctors saying, you know, you can't see me um, if you earn less than X income. I mean, that would be kind of shocking. I don't, I think, so, so that's the kind of more obvious thing this safeguards against. But sociologically, we're also very interested in more subtle forms of discrimination. Um, so again, the trends that we see of lower SES individuals being less likely to go to the doctor, they may not, you know, when you, when you interview them, they might not say, you know, doctors uh, discriminate against me, but they may say, well, it's very hard for me to go to the doctor, they don't have flexible schedules, there are few in my neighborhood, there aren't that many uh, women physicians, so that's often an issue, uh, women wanting to see women physicians uh, for cultural reasons and other reasons, um, especially women that have undergone you know, sexual assault and stuff. So, so if, they, if, if female doctors are not present for them, that could be an issue of access to, um, and LGBT doctors and, and indigenous and so on. Um, so that, again, accessibility is kind of the most um, theoretical, sociological part of this, so that's why I'm going a bit deeper into it. Um, so then comprehensive, again, means all of your health care. This, this will be huge, too, in terms of discussing um, uh, what are called alternative health care procedures. So things like chiropractic and massage and acupuncture and other things. Um, the health care system, with its universality, is based around the idea that uh, any of your uh, physical, mental, emotional, mental and emotional can, are sometimes put together, but they're also sometimes separate. Um, but mental, physical, emotional, they should all be able to uh, be satisfied and treated by the medical establishment um, that's funded by the government and taxpayer dollars and stuff. Uh, portable then means you should be able to go province to province. So if you move from Ontario um, to British Columbia or something, uh, you, you, know, you may have to get a new health card, but it, it should be simple. Uh, you should have your um, his medical history transferred, and you shouldn't have to go without care for, uh, for very long, if at all. 
Um, and then lastly, tying it all together, that this system is publicly administered. Um, so the idea here is to prevent discrimination largely by income um, and, and race and gender. So, you know, to prevent people from opening up clinics that only serve certain populations um, or have other sorts of, uh, you know, not so great beliefs about patient care. Um, and again, also to keep this a kind of national priority. Um, so again, of these, we will be discussing kind of, again, the, you know, the, the sociological question here is, um, looking at these principles, you know, obviously the top one is kind of the universality. Um, we'll be asking to what extent is healthcare universal based on how comprehensive is it? Is it covering all, you know, the sorts of health problems people have? Um, and second, second to that, or, you know, equally important, um, is it truly accessible to everyone? And those two things are linked. So if you, if you have chronic pain and you find you go to the doctor all the time and they're not really helping you, and then you go to alternative health, you may have money, but maybe this system is not working for you. How accessible is it to, to your pain? Um, so again, it gets a bit theoretical. Um, so two leading issues in the healthcare field, so even outside of sociology, um, to, like to just from healthcare providers themselves and the wider public. Again, the number one issue is unequal access to healthcare. Um, you know, it's really interesting if you follow like, not necessarily politics, but kind of state planning and taxation and all of this. Um, access and cost are of course linked, right? The, the having higher access means more money involved, right? So in the States when people were, well, many people, including people in power now, um, when they were critical of Obamacare, um, it was basically this idea of the costs, uh, like, like the, um, the, the level of access didn't justify the cost. So usually when people are debating about any sort of public policy, it's around these two issues of, okay, you're saying we need X amount of dollars to get X amount of access, maybe universal access, is that really realizable? Um, so obviously the Canadian government has chosen you know, several years ago to institute universal health care, and that's something that people value. Uh, Canadians tend to be proud of our universal health care. Um, at the same time, we also know that it's far from perfect. Uh, there are extremely long wait lists, um, so for thing, for, for, uh, particularly for specialists. Um, so if you're not deemed a priority, it can be months before you get uh, a specialist appointment. Um, so for psychiatry um, and for many kind of other more, more bodily, I guess, uh, phys uh, more, more physical, separate from the brain um, uh, issues, it can often take months for people. Um, same with surgeries. Um, so, and people often of means with more money will often go to other countries to get surgeries performed. Um, uh, and so at a national level, the cost, just in, to give you a figure of this, so again, Canada as a country has taken a stance of saying that this will be one of our major investments. Um, so it, healthcare represents 10% of our economic activity. So, so for the economists in the room, I'm sure you can explain it better than me, but the GDP is the gross domestic product and you can either look at that at a, at a macro or micro level. Um, so at a macro level, it's basically think, it's 10% of all of our economic activity. So everything that's produced, any interests we're charging other countries for loans and whatever, all of, our, all of the money that's coming out, all of the business activity, healthcare represents 10% of that. Um, that may not seem a lot, but like a lot, but that's one field taking up 10%. So it's a, it's a huge expenditure. Um, again, that's why countries vary so much in terms of their, their policies on healthcare. Um, and uh, the, the healthcare crisis we're having with aging baby boomers is uh, the, the idea that we can very well expect more and more individuals to become reliant on the healthcare system. Um, so again, this is something the, the questions are, um, again, for people that, for anyone that's critical of healthcare, it's, or, or public policy more broadly, it's, are we getting the outcomes out of this cost? So when people talk about privatization of anything, even the privatization of the Liquor Control Board of Ontario, the LCBO, privatization of, you know, the subway, it's always this sort of question. So again, just as a sociologist, think, okay, 
what are the costs involved, what are the promises made about access, to what extent are actionables being delivered. Um, and, and that's what people kind of debate about. Um, so there's some grounding for this debate. Again, you know, we're living in a polarized time where people, it's like pro-healthcare, anti-healthcare, pro-government, anti. And again, as sociologists, we're trying to, you know, st stay somewhere in the middle and understand where people are coming from. Again, that's the sociological imagination, right? Rather than, you know, taking a stance, you say, okay, I'm a researcher analyzing this, what's going on? Um, so part of the criticism of standard healthcare in Canada, again, I, I talked about the waiting lists um, and, and things like that, um, alternative healthcare as an industry, uh, you know, I've told students that have talked to me in office hours, um, I, I utilize a lot of alternative healthcare because after being at U of T for 10 years, um, I've realized I have all these like benefits and I have like two different benefit accounts. I'm a student, I'm a I'm faculty member. Um, so, you know, I'm right now very open. I'm, I'm seeing a psychotherapist, a, a massage therapist, a physiotherapist and chiropractor and a psychiatrist, so, because I've never seen one, so I was like, why not, why not see if I have, you know. Being at U of T for 10 years gives a person a lot of stress. <laughs> I'm open about that, and so I'm happy to report I don't have anything, anything I didn't think I had, but, but uh, I am, you know, uh, trying to keep my health on check. Um, but on a serious note, you know, it's also part of what prevented me from doing this before was the cost uh, and also how I felt in doctor's offices. Um, you know, I, I, it, it's hard to talk about things like mental health and, phys and, and, you know, not overt health pains, but, you know, I, I feel I have posture problems. I used to get migraines. I, I very often do get kind of depressed, but I don't, I, you know, I, I didn't want to go on medication, all of these things. So. Um, anyway, I'm happy. I'm not going to put all that, all that on film and make myself sound, you know, whatever. But, um, but I'm happy to talk to you about, about, you know, working your way through these, these uh, things, these resources we have available to us. Um, but the more and more I talk to people about this, the more I see this is a common story of people kind of feeling, you know, I feel my health isn't quite right on some level, but I don't know what to do about it. I go to the doctor. They want to, you know, you know they kind of treat me like a number. They give me a prescription. But that's not what I want. Um, so. Alternative healthcare, uh, quote, is those treatment, treatments and healthcare practices not widely taught in med medical schools nor routinely used in hospitals, and most importantly here, not typically reimbursed by health benefit plans. Um, so these include the ones I go to, so uh, chiropractic, massage therapy, um, other relaxation techniques, so there's things like uh, yoga therapy, prenatal therapies, uh, assist assisted stretching, all of these things, um, prayer, acupuncture, and people spend a lot of money on this. So $8 billion a year annually. Um, and so, you know, I just want you to think before, I'll, I'll open it up to you guys and your study buddies to think about this, but as a sociologist, alternative health is fascinating because um, just, you know, before I have you talk about it, Aside from what I said, what do you think might, or, or a more specific example, what do you think might prompt a person to use um, one of those sorts of healthcare providers? In terms of what we said before, or what was said in the previous slides. What might prompt a person, do you think? Yep. something, you need it right now, and you can't really afford to wait mm -hmm. for any longer. Um, so they might turn to like other private practices just to get the care they need. Right. So um, the long wait time. So it's not, you know, the long wait time, oftentimes people will say, oh, you know, it's an inconvenience. Um, but let's say you are someone who is, you know, you really feel you're having a mental health crisis and you need help right now. And again, I've, I've talked to students about this, and I've been in this place myself. Um, a psychotherapist may have an availability that day. Um, you'll have to pay out of pocket, but you can get treatment right away. Um, and it doesn't, it's not under the same formal channels. So also, you know, mental health problems are highly stigmatized in our society by many people. 
Um, and, you know, I'm guilty of feeling my own self-stigma about issues like that. Um, and, you know, I, I decided in the summer to see a psychotherapist, and I was so happy that I did, just like as a conversation. Um, and then I could, you know, kind of sort through um, just issues in my life. Uh, but for years, I told myself, you know, no, I don't want to do that. Um, you know, I don't want to be, you know, I, I, I'm, I don't need that. Um, so many people, again, uh, have, have felt that way too uh, about chiropractic. So they will, you know, they'll go and have x-rays done by doctors, um, and then they'll still feel they have pain, but technically they're not diagnosable with anything. Um, so they will use these alternative healthcare systems. Um, again, these draw on many of these, these lead to many issues though, um, that these are typically not paid for and they're quite expensive. Um, so for, you know, uh, a select few can actually take use of this. Um, but so before we break out into, into discussions about this, just because I think, again, the case of alternative healthcare sociologically is really interesting because it taps into a lot of different themes. Um, this kind of alternative healthcare system raises uh, a series of challenges to the, the more accepted uh, medical healthcare industry. Um, so number one, and this, is, this impacts all of us. So you can think of us as consumers in, uh, in this regard. Um, so alternative healthcare workers um, may not undergo standardized training. Um, so this is something I know from when I was looking up massage therapists. Like, I didn't know anything about these industries. Um, a registered mas massage therapist um, undergoes very standardized training, um, but there are unlicensed ones um, and, you know, I don't think there, it's very likely that they'll injure you or anything, but that's very different than if you're going to, say, a medical doctor and then having, um, you know, seeing a doctor of physiotherapy treating you. Um, you, may, you. You don't know ahead of time if you're seeing someone who's unlicensed um, just what sorts of expertise they have. Um, and again, that does not mean they're necessarily going to be inferior, um, but it, it just means there's more of a chance of that because they haven't undergone the same training. Um, alternative uh, healthcare systems have hidden costs that could overwhelm the system's ability uh, to, to play, um, so to play out, so the system's ability to, to function properly. Um, so alternative healthcare, um, often it involves much more holistic treatment. Um, so again, in, they often work in tandem. So people that see chiropractors will often see massage therapists, um, and then, you know, they'll start to link um, their physical symptoms with mental health symptoms as well. Um, so the, the body, there's a great book called The Body Keeps Score. Um, my friend's doing her PhD at Harvard, actually. She did her undergrad and master's here with me. Um, she recommended that book to me because I was telling her, you know, oh, I always have these different things. Sometimes it's my back, sometimes it's my neck. Other times I get a bit upset. Well, I could, I could just kind of tell when I'm not in the best mood. And then she said, no, there's like a whole literature talking about how you know, uh, when your brain can't handle it, your body keeps score of your stress. So, and that's things we know, right? But, but it's, uh, it's, it was interesting because that, this, this was written by a medical doctor who encountered a lot of resistance. Um, going back to our socialization week, he was writing about the impact of like early childhood abuse. And he said, a lot of people that have chronic health symptoms when they're older, something happened when they were young and they're, it's kind of in them um, and, and it manifests through things like itchiness and ticks and pain and all of this. So um, again, I'm not trying to have you <laughs> psychoanalyze yourselves and find symptoms, um, but it's, uh, anyway, this, this is very much a uh, different level of explanation than the medical one where it's, you know, you have X symptomology, meaning you have uh, um, the concordant syndrome or complex. Uh, this, is, this is a much different view and it's very, it can get quite costly if you're trying to um, rewire yourself around this way. Um, and then linked to that is the lack of scientific evidence. Um, again, these, many of these treatments are increasingly, they're, they're highly, so going back, way back in the course to our discussion of Orientalism and imperialism and, col and colonialism, many of these treatments are quite Eastern um, in, in their, their background. Um, so they're, they're, quite, they're quite explicit, many of them, in uh, Buddhist philosophies um, and, and Zen, you know, yoga coming from uh, Hindu uh, backgrounds. Um, so, so these treatments, again, uh, often seem very not super scientific if you're coming from a more positivistic framework, 
right? So remember when we talked about um, positivist versus anti-positivist. Um, so again, we're in an interesting time for many reasons. The discussion of health also is opening up and, and increasingly alternative treatments are being put into the mainstream, but they're still kind of marginalized. Um, and again, that's reflected in the universal health care, that these treatments are not put um, as, they're, they're not paid for by OHIP. Um, interestingly, the university, through its private insurance, that again, as a full-time undergraduate, you would have that, or full-time graduate student or instructor, um, the amounts that go to these industries uh, are going up, like, like in terms of the coverage we get. Um, so it'll be interesting to see in 10 years uh, whether these have been seen as more legitimate or to what extent they've been legitimized more. Um, so just to get you thinking more about this, I know you're all, you're all focused on the test, so I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, and that's why it's all, you're all quiet. Um, but with your study buddies, so again, just to think through. So you want to think through these themes of, again, why would someone use these procedures? Um, what was going on? Um, so have you or has anyone you know had experiences with alternative health care? Um, so things just to think, again, you want to think through the, certain, the person's thought process, kind of using that sociological imagination. Um, so what, which services were utilized? What prompted them to use these services? How did others react to the use of these services? I'm sure some of you have stories about that. And ultimately, were these services effective? Again, they're much more heterogeneous than the medical industry, right? Because um, there's so many different levels of skill, so many different kinds of treatment. Um, again, I've been through a lot of these myself, so I know that. I'm not demonizing the industry. They're, the industry's so broad, you can't really paint broad brush that way. Um, but some are, in my opinion, more effective than others um, on a case-by-case -case basis. So um, just things to think about. So again, break out into your study buddies and talk, you know, have, have you or anyone you know um, been involved in alternative health care, and why did they do it, and, and what happened as a result. I heard talking, so I know people have awesome experiences to share. Yep. Well, I, I mean, I know, I know people in my family who have, like, been to the doctor before for uh, pains, and the doctor would recommend them to try uh, massage therapy, mm -hmm. or something like that, to, you know, to better help, like, their back pain or something along those lines. So, and I mean, I know they would say it's very effective, but I think it's just like a placebo effect where like you believe you're doing something, so it's just so it happens kind of. Yeah, so that's a good example. So even though these two industries are different, um, oftentimes uh, doctors will recommend. So, so some, someone, uh, you know, if they're having pain and aches, and uh, let's say even they've given them an x-ray or not, um, they'll often recommend massage therapy just as a kind of de-stressing thing. Um, so sometimes they do work kind of uh, in combination. That's kind of the, the allied view of, of health. Um, yep. Mm -hmm. She worked like out of her house, so I, don't know, I guess she. I think she went to like the people for like when they gave birth. But she had like it wasn't like an office. It was sort of like a in her living room. It was also like her work room. Mm -hmm. and she had like pictures of female anatomy all over the walls when you walked in the door, and it was a little weird. But <laughs> yeah. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really understand it, and it seemed a little strange because it, that's like it's not very common. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah, so a uh, doula is like a midwife, um, so they'll have in hospitals, you know, the, the per, it's, it's like 98% women, I think, that do it, um, is the statistic, but uh, it's, it's someone who assists the physician with the birthing procedure, um, with childbirth, the birthing procedure. So um, they, the, a doula will do that in the house, um, and it's more uh, holistic, so often it'll be in like a pool of water, um, and then they, they typically work from home. Um, so obviously when people want that, um, a lot of that is kind of harking back to, say, you know, a pre-industrial view of childbirth, not part of this big medical um, hospital uh, climate, uh, just wanting something feeling more organic. Um, so that's, that's a common reason for people turning to alternative healthcare procedures as well. Um, okay, yeah, so just, again, things to think about 
with, with these treatments. So the way I'm going to do this today, again, so we'll have our break at uh, 3.30 instead of 3. So if you have to run out, um, you can. But um, we'll break at 3.30 to get, to get our sessions set up. Um, and during the break, I'll play the, uh, the uh, steady video, the new one. Um, OK. So we've discussed what health is broadly and moving to the social definition of health or health is a social thing. Um, and then we've looked at the uh, kind of medical health system versus alternative health system, discussed how these two things often have a frictional relationship, um, but sometimes it depend, you know, depends on who you're talking to, who your healthcare provider is. Um, they do, they're increasingly trying to work um, in a more partnership or alliance model as well. Um, so now we move on, before we, before we get to aging and disabilities, um, we move on to our theoretical perspectives on health. Um, so from the functionalist perspective, if you're looking at health like other things, uh, like with education and crime, um, when we assess health, we see health as a barometer of a society's overall well-being. Um, so health care is important here in that it keeps, again, in functionalism, Emile Durkheim, society is an organism. Um, so if all of the institutions represent the organs within the social body, uh, the, the individual people within that are the cells. Um, so functionalist says, well, healthcare is important to keep the body alive at a very kind of micro level. You want to make sure all your, all your cells are functioning, keeping your blood flowing and toxins out and all of this. Um, so by treating the ill, we maintain a stable society. Um, so functionalism is very, is, is pretty simple um, in terms of their approach to healthcare. It's, you know, if a researcher is interested in just doing population level demographics of health, um, they could implicitly be taking this perspective. Um, they're just looking at health levels and the assumption is that, well, good health is good for society. And so, um, and it's not a super, it's not a particularly critical lens here. Um, conflict theorists agree um, that this is true as well. Um, so the, the idea would be, uh, yes, that of course, you know, having sick individuals is not good for uh, a society overall. Um, you know, they'll, they'll be less able to function well in society. They'll be in pain. Uh, their lifespans could be reduced. Um, but rather than focus on that, they emphasize that um, the... The, so they emphasize the inequalities within health. Um, so looking at the issue of access and universality, they say, well, rich individuals can get treatment much more easily than poor individuals. Um, so using alternative health care as the example, um, an individual suffering from a lot of pain uh, can, if they have a ton of money, they can go and see chiropractors and psychotherapists and all of this. Um, even someone in my position, because I'm working in a role that gives me insurance, um, that's something I couldn't do 10 years ago. Um, I thought of seeing a chiropractor before I went to university, uh, but it just seemed way too expensive. Uh, whereas now, you know, I can go a certain number of times a year um, for free with my insurance. So a conflict theorist would say, you know, this was preventing you from doing that before. Um, and, you know, uh, think of if I was extremely wealthy, I could see the best therapists around the world. I could fly to places um, and, and for, for medical procedures. Um, so... They, they also are critical, so again, I was framing it more in a conflict way of the, of kind of the, the established legitimate healthcare versus alternative healthcare. Um, conflict theorists also created the term medicalization, which we'll see that feminist theorists use as well. Um, so medicalization is looking at both the positives and the negatives that come out of labeling certain symptoms as diagnosable disorders or problems. Um, so I'll just say that again. So medicalization is good and bad, um, but it, it's the labeling of, of certain kind of visible or visible symptoms, uh, the labeling of symptomology as disordered. Um, so on the good side, um, and some of them are, are double-sided, but um, you know, labeling that can be generative is the, la the labeling of many mental health issues. Um, so things like depression and anxiety, um, by labeling those as real disorders, people can get treated. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily mean they have to go on anti-anxiety and anti-depression medication, but it means that their symptoms can be treated as real and not just, you know, like in the, in the distant past, in the not so distant past, people would often say, you know, just get through it, grow up. Um, but now, uh, you know, it's, it's a legitimate issue. Um, video game addiction recently, so this summer, the WHO, speaking of them again, they, act, they, they diagnosed video game addiction as a real addiction. Um, so that was, uh, that was a big moment of, I told you so to, to my friends and, and uh, my, even my professors who said, really, that's an addiction? And I said, yes, it's very much like, like uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's like cigarette addiction. It's, uh, it's, it's less physiological than psychological, but it's felt extremely in a real way. It reroutes your reward systems and, and all of that. So labeling video game addiction is good, but it also counts as an example of where medicalization can go wrong because um, just, what do you think could be, remember Merton, latent functions, unintended consequences. What could be an unintended consequence of video game addiction being created? Yep. Maybe suddenly everyone will think they're Yeah, and pe people might ban their kids from playing games. They might say, oh, you know, I wasn't doing so well in school. It must be because I'm actually addicted to this. Um, they may start, so the, the flip side of medicalization is that it tends, it, it, in many cases, uh, when something's recently medicalized, it can lead to moral panics that we discussed last class, right? Um, so people can say, no, don't play video games. You know, I just read in the WHO um, that this is uh, something that can cause addiction. Um, so the resistance to video game addiction as being a real addiction was exactly that. Like maybe you're overblowing it. Um, the same with uh, another one that's often uh, on the public radar is ADHD. Um, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, many individuals do suffer from that, um, but it's also become a very quick diagnosis. So, oh, you know, Bobby or Sally or whoever, they're running around all the time, they're not focusing in school, uh, maybe they should go on Ritalin because they have ADHD. Um, again, most doctors won't do that now, but, but that was something that, that the medical industry was highly criticized for. Um, so medical conflict theorists bring this in. Again, looking at this from a critical perspective, they would say medicalization works to legitimate the, uh, legitim le I'm not, I can't even speak, to legitimize the medical industry by saying, oh, you know, here's another case of something that we can solve for you. We can diagnose these symptoms for you as being part of a disorder. Um, so again, the critique of that is that more and more things will be medicalized um, and all of that will make kind of the, the medical, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, very powerful so that people come to rely on it. Um, symbolic interactionism here is pretty simple. Um, they also discuss medicalization to an extent. So here health is just, it's, it's seen from the micro perspective. So um, the discussion of labeling is important here. Uh, so here people use health um, as labels and it tends to be health and illness. Again, I, I said the definition from health as being not sick to then this broader idea of well-being. Um, symbolic interactionists find that people really do tend to see health and illness as binary opposites. Um, so this leads to self-fulfilling prophecies. So people who, th uh, people who think that they're sick uh, will then be more likely, uh, ironically, to also avoid behaviors that may cause them to get better. Um, so if you, know, if you are convinced that you have chronic pain, um, you may think exercising will make that worse, or you may think, what's the point? I've given up. Um, so that could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, again, that can be real, not demonizing people that do that. Um, I've been there myself, you know, when I'm like, oh, I have back pain anyway, or I have headaches. There's no point in working on it. It's only going to get worse. Maybe I'll make it worse. Um, symbolic interactionists look on labeling. Um, again, labeling theory is the idea that once you're labeled as, as something, so in this case sick, you then think you're that way and you live that way. Um, so if someone says you have anxiety, um, and you may start to become even more anxious in your social surroundings, saying, oh, I'm actually like wired differently, I have social anxiety, uh, uh, and, and then that can cause you to um, exacerbate the problem that you already had. 
Um, and lastly, from the theoretical perspective, feminist theory, um, they look at medicalization as well. So they say, you know, J Dorothy Smith, remember she said how sociology and why a sociology for women was needed. Um, she said that, uh, remember the field was androcentric, so focused on men. So feminist theorists, when they look at health, they say many of our diagnoses um, and even clinical trials have been based on men. Um, so this gets really important and fascinating, but also horrible, when you look at the history of clinical trials and drug development. Um, many of the drugs and treatments were done using only males um, as, the, as the testers. Um, so a lot of, of the, uh, several medications have been, you know, increasingly critiqued, saying they were designed uh, for men and not women. Um, and so part of why women often report higher health problems um, could be due to them taking medication that's not designed, uh, that wasn't designed around them. Because uh, there are biological differences in terms of how we, you know, metabolize, of how men and women metabolize uh, different substances. Um, so that's feminists talked about that, um, and also certain disorders um, and, and treatments that uh, become dismissed. Um, so again, women are more likely um, to suffer from, I believe, uh, fibromyalgia, so kind of pain and discomfort from unknown sources. Um, so just general feelings of discomfort. Um, and that's something that has increasingly been realized. Uh, but feminist theorists said, well, you know, that was lumped in with, quote unquote, you know, women's time of the month or whatever in the past or with menstruation cycles, with, uh, quote unquote, hy hysteria, uh, which meant, you know, womb craziness or something. So all these, this baggage, the, the sexist baggage, the sexist cultural baggage um, has had an impact on, on women's health. Uh, uh, and that's what feminists tend to focus, focus on. Okay, um, so any questions about health before we move to aging and disabilities? Um, each section will progressively get shorter because you'll, you'll see they build on one another. Um, the primary one is health, and then we kind of look at how health relates to aging and then how disabilities and their kind of change over time um, are, are one component of health. Um, and again, I'm sorry to go fast, but I just want to... I know it's, uh, I'm doing a little strategic budgeting and thinking it makes more sense to spend more time on the test review uh, because the test is covering nine weeks and this is only one of those. Um, and this will be freshest in your mind anyway. Um, so aging. Um, so as we all know, uh, one of the big demographic changes, and I mentioned it earlier, is that our population is getting older and older. Um, so you can see from the numbers here, um, we only had 5% of the population, almost, I can't believe how fast time's going. So in 1921, 98 years ago, um, only 5% were 65 or older, um, but we're projected to have 27%. Um, so, so, you know, going up five and a half times in magnitude, uh, our, our, our population of seniors by 2056. Um, so this means that we are going to have many more older individuals in society. Um, absolutely, so in terms of raw numbers, there will be more individuals of that age, but then proportionately more. Um, so we will have many, many more, we'll have a quarter of our population potentially needing to be part of these healthcare systems. Um, just because it's a, an unfortunate fact of life that as you age, uh, you, you become that's kind of the definition of becoming unhealthy, uh, in that your body begins to um, shut down, and then you ultimately um, are terminated. Um, so, so I'm using bizarre terminology, so I apologize. But um, that's, that's, I don't know, I'm not sure how to explain the aging process other than that. Um, of course, there's lovely aspects of aging. I'm, I'm not saying life, aging is not just a process of becoming terminated, but um, that, that is ultimately at the biological level, your system's shutting down. I'm, the further I go, the worse it sounds, and I think, oh my gosh, I'm a third of the way through my life, so I don't, anyway, it becomes existential. Um, so, uh, it's a, so, Issues facing seniors. So, okay, so again, we're dealing with an older population, and again, statistically, just because of the aging process, older individuals are more likely to be using healthcare. So, healthcare is on the public radar more increasingly. 
Um, again, and I just frame that very darkly. The, the uh, aging, you know, people, part of why we have so many older people is because people are staying healthier longer. Um, so, you know, it's uh, the, the lifespan's going up. So it's a great thing, um, but it just means there's going to be more and more people um, concerned about their health relative to uh, the population numbers. Um, so there are six primary issues that, that, see, that older individuals face. Um, again, right now, you know, our definition of senior has been 65 and older for many years. But as the lifespan increases, even currently, um, you know, that may shift higher, right? Maybe the new senior will be 75 by the time um, I'm older. Who knows? Or we're all older. Um, so the top issues. Um, so transition to retirement. Um, so this is an issue that we will all have to face at some point in our lives and is very tied to other common sociological factors. Um, so the process of retirement is literally retiring, you know, to retire means, you know, to, to, to stop, to go away. Um, so so reti retiring um, is typically quitting your paid employment, your formal employment. Um, this as you know, relatively young people or people that are you know, starting work, this sounds like an amazing thing. You know, people think, oh, I can't wait till I can retire. Um, but in this actual process, at this actual time of the lifespan, um, there, are sudden, there are often sudden bursts of depression and anxiety and fear. Uh, because when you're retiring, again, it's that negative thing, you're, you're leaving your current way of life. Um, so you may have not liked everything about your job, but it gave you stability, it gave you something to do every day, you had a routine, you may have had some friends. Um, all of those things go away in the retirement process. Um, again, this is different for different people. Um, some people can retire to, with pensions, others uh, have to work longer because they don't have pensions or they may be in debt. Um, so the transition to re retirement is very sociological in that it's based on things like income. Uh, gender plays into this as well, too, um, in that, in that uh, you know, if you were the primary breadwinner, that is different. Uh, you know, f what is formal retirement for someone who was, uh, you know, the domestic person? If you were in a one-income um, one household, that's very different. Uh, so in traditional kind of uh, nuclear families, when the husband would retire, that wouldn't just impact his life, that would greatly impact the wife's life as well. Um, because now, you know, she had, had, a, had an arrangement of her own and now he may be at home every day um, or, you know, other things. So the transition to retirement is kind of a big thing that looms on the mind of older individuals. Um, financial pressures, of course, that goes along with it. I mentioned it uh, as well. So um, many people, you know, Freedom 55, that's the idea of early retirement, that is becoming a thing of the past for sure as pensions go down um, and as uh, the pay gap between uh, poorer individuals and richer individuals goes up. Um, it's very lofty for most people to think that they can retire at age 55. Um, I think the new number will probably be closer to 70 by the time we're around there. Um, but again, I'm not trying to make anyone upset. So this is good because you can, you have more time to find your vocation and your calling in the world, right? So, and you'll be super healthy because we keep getting healthier every generation. So not, don't think of your grandparents working at age 70. You won't be like them. You'll, you'll be um, a Gen Z, you know, whatever, live streaming and stuff to people. So it'll, it'll be different. It'll be cool. Um, okay, so, so the transition is difficult. The finance, not that granny and grandpa weren't cool, but, you know, not the same way we are. Um, and I'm lumping myself in with you guys, so. Um, okay, then age discrimination. Uh, so that's a major thing, again, coming back more to sociological proper things. Um, as someone gets older, again, we're in a very youth-focused society. Um, you know, just people want to be young. They, you know, they lament on their lives as they're older. Anti-aging creams, the gym, um, ways of staying current. Um, you know, this is part of why I have a YouTube channel, trying to vampire into you guys in your youth. Um, so age discrimination is a real thing. Uh, you know, people feel um, as they, again, as they're retiring, now I'm going to be out of my social circles. I'm going to be that quote unquote old person. Um, and, and people clearly um, don't like that. Again, just 
do a little mental exercise and think of yourself, snap your fingers, you're age 70, think how would your life be different, would you be accepted in your social circles? Um, it's not always the most happy thought for people to have. Um, and linked to that is vulnerability to crime. Um, so older individuals are very like are, are much more likely to be the vic the targets or victims of um, of uh, kind of low level assaults and thefts. Um, so things like purse snatching and burglarizing, um, they they seem like easier targets because well you know and it's quite it's quite a. Uh, Horrific when you see them on the news, the cases of, you know, 80 and 90 year olds being uh, beaten up and having things stolen from them. Um, they make very easy targets because they're usually not as loud. They're clearly not going to be as agile in most cases. Um, and they're also less likely to report um, crimes uh, because they may not feel, uh, they may be more depressed as it is and may not feel it's as immediate. Um, a concern, and they, ha and they also have narrower networks, so there's less people that could report for them. Um, uh, Long-term care and chronic pain is linked to the final one of preparing to die. Um, so again, something people think about as they get older, you know, at what point will I, not, will I no longer be able to care for myself? Um, so there's one thing to say that you know, your body is degenerating and it's becoming harder for you to do things for a variety of reasons, um, and that you have chronic pain. It's a whole other one to say, you know, is this pain so severe that, that A, I can't even take care of myself anymore, and B, is it worth me living? And am I kind of at the point now where I think I'm closer to death than life? Um, so that was one of my big research topics in my dissertation on, I looked at um, in, the, in the UK, because um, there was changing legislation, just like in Canada, around uh, do not resuscitate orders and physician-assisted suicide. Um, and many older, they're called, these. Uh, sometimes you think, what, what term, what are these social scientists thinking? Um, but people, I believe it was over age 80, are called, are called the oldest old. Um, so the, anyway, among the oldest old, um, these, these thoughts are quite rampant um, of, of thinking, okay, when am I really ready to go? Um, so in these interviews, people were, were asked to think about this. And for many of them, you know, it was, if I become a vegetable. And then they're asked, well, what does that mean? And it's like, well, if I, if I forget my name, if I can't get out of bed. Um, and, and many are quite serious. And there's been laws passed, again, in Canada and other countries, um, to that legalized physician-assisted suicide. So legalized pulling the plug. Um, that's always been somewhat legal in most countries, but this new one is for the new laws are around um, this, uh, having uh, incurable illnesses and chronic pain. Um, so these legislations are kind of blurry, but they're taking seriously, again, the fact that, you know, these are decisions that people have to make. Uh, and ultimately, if, if it's you that's feeling it, um, should you have to live a life that you don't want to live? Um, so after all of that happy, very optimistic talk, um, the theories of aging. So, so um, again, so thinking uh, as, as a sociologist, how do we study the aging process? Um, because again, we're all aging. And, it's, and, and you know, I've, again, I've framed it around the, the end point, but aging is something we're doing every day, right? And aging is great. Aging is learning. Aging is growing. Um, you know, you can always frame things positively and not so positively. Um, so functionalism sees, um, you know, you'll see both functionalism and conflict theory frame and symbolic interactionism frame aging in very different ways, but with room to see both sides, both the positive and, and, negative, and more negative aspects. Um, so disengagement theory is, li is quite literal of a term. So it is the idea that um, in order to age successfully, most people will choose to disengage from society. So right now you're engaged, you're in class, you're gonna be, you're most, many of you are already in the labor market, you're getting training. Um, retirement is kind of like, so long suckers, I've been here, done that, now I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna golf and knit and whatever. Um, and, and well, again, when, we're, when, when you're all that age, it'll be, I'm gonna uh, become the next uh, lead Twitch person and, and live streamer um, or whatever. I can't, I wonder what it'll be in 50 years. Um, but anyway, that's something, something just interesting to think. Uh, but so disengagement theory is, again, the idea that you will recoil in a positive way from society, um, and you will embrace your older life. 
Um, so you will be released from these, retirement again is positive, you're released from, from hard work, from your boss, from your commitments. Um, and now you are free to kind of do whatever you want. So there, retirement is a welcome relief. You know, when someone says, let's retire to the living room with a glass of wine, that's that idea of retirement, of leaving, and it's a positive moment. Um, conflict theory, on the other hand, puts, uh, focuses more on, again, the demographic bulge, as it's called, of older individuals. They say, well, now, looking at ageism, uh, you can look at institutional ageism as a thing. So as you have all of these older individuals in society, you see tr trends and correlations, such as more people getting plastic surgery, more people following, um, you know, get young quick schemes, if you want to call them that, uh, things, things like different sorts of healthcare treatments, um, different sorts of diets, trying to beat the clock. Um, so conflict theorists, conflict theorists are interested in seeing how age and the kind of reduction of age fits into broader kind of economic things. So, you know, com companies and elites in their terms benefiting from this age industry. Um, so again, they're, they're benefiting from ageism. So conflict theory here sees kind of it um, a young versus old um, and the older constantly trying to seem young. Um, so functionalism here, so what's interesting, usually functionalism and conflict theorist theory are kind of, you know, in the, in the lectures, I framed them as, you know, functionalism is one extreme, conflict theory is another extreme, and symbolic interactionism is usually in the middle. Um, this week it's a little bit different. So the two kind of more competing ones, um, you know, conflict theory here is very macro and it's, it's critical of, of public reception to aging. Um, but disengagement theory from functionalism and what's called activity theory from symbolic interactionism here are kind of the two opposites. Um, so just as a refresher, again, disengagement theory, it's very easy to remember. It's the classic view of, of aging. You retire from society, you disengage. And that's a good thing. Activity theory, however, um, and, our, and your lead TA, Jason, if he was here, he could talk a lot about this. That's what his dissertation's on. Um, activity theory says, no, you know, actually, uh, older individuals are increasingly wanting to remain engaged with society. Um, so when I said, you know, the age of retirement might shift from people dreaming of retiring at age 55, now there's increasing numbers of people that don't want to retire. And the reason why they don't, it's not just because they need the money, but they also don't want to feel old. Um, and so uh, activity theory also says, you know, maybe we will continue to see more old people, more older individuals at the gym. Again, not because they're battling aging, but because they just don't feel old. Um, they follow that idea of, you know, you're only as young as you feel. Um, so symbolic interactionism, again, it's a theory that focuses on how people interpret things, right? So we're saying, you know, the flip side of the functional, of, uh, of conflict theory, remember conflict theory was saying, you know, age, ageism is institutionalized and, and youth is being put on a pedestal. Symbolic interactionists say, well, maybe, maybe people are happy to be trying to be younger, and that's not what they're thinking. They're thinking, I'm just going to be engaged. I don't want to be like my grandparents. I want to stay part of the labor market. I want to still stay current. Um, so these are two very different views of aging. Again, the functionalist withdrawal thesis, so again, thinking, yes, Freedom 55, versus the uh, activity theory of saying, actually, I never, want to, I never want to withdraw. I want to be part of society as I see it um, this whole time. That's what my grandparents did, not me. Um, so we'll skip the third one, but I want you to do this one just for a couple of minutes. Um, so compare and contrast disengagement theory with the activity theory on aging. Um, and think, so just like two minutes with your, with your buddy, which approach, so you can just focus on the first question. Which approach to aging do you think is better for people? So again, I'm tapping in to the life pulse of the youngsters. What do you think, um, which do you find more compelling and which actually do you think you'll be doing uh, when you're older? Do you, do you, can you see yourself more disengaging or um, boosting your activities? So discuss. Get started. I'm keeping our amazing uh, 
so, but if you want to share anything with me during the break, please do. Um, again, I just uh, I, I want to uh, hint, test, have you talk about things that, that I think are testable. Um, okay, and I'm, I'm trying to gear my presentation more towards the important things today that I think will be on the test. So, um, and I wrote the test, so I kind of have an idea of what's on the test. Um, Okay, so last, last one, again, not to de-emphasize, these are all equally important, but again, unfortunately in this class, we're covering everything under the social sun, so certain things, uh, you know, I, I tend to spend more time on one and then build on, on, build on it using the others as examples. Um, so disability, again, very linked to the idea, you know, I kept, I was talking so much and giving all these little anecdotes about alternative medicine, um, just because, you know, that is the direction society's going in, the, whether they're allies from a more functionalist perspective or, or enemies or frenemies from a more conflict perspective, um, you know, our definitions of health are widening. Um, and so dis, and, and as are our ideas of ability and disability, um, these are things that are simultaneously becoming more medicalized, but also more subjective. Um, the intersections between mental health and well-being and physical symptoms are becoming, uh, you know, it's, it's a paradox because our, our tools that we use to diagnose illness are getting more sophisticated, but we're also realizing, remember that anti-positivist stance, we're also realizing that maybe we don't have all the solutions. Maybe there's something else. Maybe people that, are, that continually feel, um, quote unquote, psychological symptoms, um, maybe they're actually having something we've yet to diagnose. Um, so disability, um, the, the, the shift in disability, I mean, disability studies is now a field of its own. Um, the previous definition or the classic definition of disability uh, was very linked to, again, it was the inverse of health. Um, so disabled, meaning, you know, able is that you can do, um, and dis is the, you know, the kind of negative uh, prefix. So a disabled person um, was someone who couldn't function. Um, in society, you know, if you, if you were visually impaired, you can't see to the extent that you need to in society. Hearing impaired, even the word impaired, it's, it's quite negative connotation. Um, so now the shift is rather than seeing disabled people as a group of people, now we see people that may have disabilities. Um, so people with disabilities is now the terminology that's used. Um, again, this is one of those complex arenas because Disability as a group, as a, as a grouping, and, dis, and, and individuals with, disa with disabilities have benefited for, from that medicalization in that their pains and their issues have been treated re as real. But medicalization also leads to these groups being seen as stigmatized and marginal. Um, you know, even though there are active uh, led legal moves, uh, legal changes, um, where, you know, employers cannot discriminate on the basis of disability. Um, we all know that oftentimes judgments, uh, that managers might make, judgments that, you know, even in relationships and partnerships, people often implicitly make judgments, um, on things like, um, income and gender and race and ability, uh, that are not totally legal. Um, so disability, again, is this, uh, it's now being seen as something that is medicalized, but also something that can be seen as a real barrier to people's lives, even when treated. Um, so the focus now is not on that you're unable to do things that quote unquote normal or able-bodied people can do, um, but more seeing to what extent are your activities or your actions restricted from your point of view. Um, so it's, it's, again, a more subjective focus. Uh, that way it kind of takes the emphasis off from labeling someone and saying, oh, you're disabled in this way. It's more, okay, you're seeing the doctor. What pains and problems are you experiencing? Maybe you have this sort of disability that many other people have, and we can treat this. Um, so it's a more patient-focused approach. Um, again, the difference might seem subtle, but in terms of structure and agency, it's more seeing, yes, disability can structure your life, um, but we shouldn't be imposing it on to people, saying, oh, you know, your life must be awful because you can't X, or you're having a harder time doing Y, um, and now seeing, oh, maybe things can be built more around you, um, here's something else you can do instead, here's a way you can make this easier. Um, again, just subtle but very important ways of making people feel they have uh, of letting people know that they have more agency. 
Um, so some key uh, re more recent disabilities, and again, the, in terms of subjective and rules and, and codes expanding, uh, mental illness and mental disorders are increasingly being seen as disabilities in the sense that they restrict people from doing things that they want to do. Um, so again, uh, as I mentioned, women are more likely to report higher rates of mood and anxiety dis disorders. Um, so they are more likely than men to feel depressed, to feel anxious, um, and they report these as issues because they're often preventing them um, from doing things that they would like. Uh, entering meaningful relationships, exiting relationships, um, applying for certain jobs, um, all sorts of things that you can think uh, not feeling so well uh, mentally could cause a person to do. Um, and so again, the medicalization of more and more mental illnesses on the one hand can be seen as a boon or a bonus for women now. It's another way that they're, you know, moving towards equality. Um, but if people then come to uh, discriminate on the basis of having seen a psychiatrist or, or been on antidepressants, then that could actually be quite bad uh, for women and other people that do this. Um, and sociologically speaking again, so not just women, but as I mentioned, lower income individuals are also more likely to experience and self-report mood disorders and mental disorders more broadly. Um, again, the major ones are general depression and general anxiety. Um, and as someone who's, uh, who, who, you know, you all took and were tested on classical theory, and we keep talking about it, um, the, the, you know, remember Durkheim, even though he's a sociologist, was very interested in mental health. Um, his whole concept of anime was this idea of feeling normless and that he thought could lead to, to suicidal ideation. Um, and remember Merton with the discussion of the American dream and people adapting to anomic societies. Um, these issues are, are very sociological. It, it makes sense as a sociologist that people that are pushed more to the margins would be experiencing role strain and discomfort. Um, so again, these, these mental health here um, is, even though it's often framed as a kind of individual disorder, um, it's very sociological in that there are clear patterns in who experiences these symptoms, who's more likely to report it, who reports them as impacting their lives, um, and in terms of remedies that can be done. Um, you know, oftentimes higher depression and anxiety, they come from uh, experiences of being discriminated against, not having meaningful employment, uh, the, the way you're treated in school, all of these things. So uh, many social factors. Um, and part of why this is very important to study too is that when mental disorders are untreated, uh, you have a, a downward self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so the downward drift is the idea that um, people with mental illnesses are often will often go lower in the socioeconomic ladder due to not being able to get uh, well-paying jobs, go to good educational, good institutions, um, and maintain strong peer networks. Um, again, if you're suffering from mental illness, you are more likely to then uh, self-isolate um, or even self-harm. Um, so those things then prevent you uh, from uh, bettering your situation or they make it uh, more difficult. Um, and the definition of disability, again, moving away from something as, from being uh, not healthy to then thinking how is it restricting your life. Um, obesity is a, a kind of, it's a more um, controversial disability. I mean, most people probably don't think of it uh, as a disability. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, obesity is seen as being uh, a kind of epidemic in North American society. Um, so increasingly people are um, becoming, are, are getting higher BMIs, so body mass index, index. Um, and medically this is a pressing issue because people with higher BMIs are more likely to have shorter lifespans. Um, and again, statistically speaking, it's not saying every single person who um, weighs more, you know, they could be big bones, they could be very healthy, but just tend to carry more weight, they could have thyroid problems. Um, but speaking, uh, that, are, that aren't impacting their, their blood pressure, um, but speaking uh, broadly, uh, people that, that are, are heavier on the weight spectrum or people that are extremely underweight uh, tend, to, tend to report more health problems and have shorter lifespans than people that are kind of tending more towards the mean. 
Um, and so uh, this can be viewed through functionalism or conflict theory or symbolic interactionism, a lot of the same trends. So you can, uh, there's often a self-fulfilling prophecy with obesity um, that once you're overweight, you may think, oh, well, I'm unhealthy, I might as well give up. Um, you see that a lot on shows like The Biggest Loser um, and My 600 Pound Life, where people feel extremely depressed once they're overweight and they feel like a lost cause. Um, and, and people that intervene often try to get them to not do that. Um, it can all, almost feel like an addiction. Um, and for functionalism, again, it's, well, we want to keep people healthy. Uh, let's help them be at good weights. But conflict theorists would say, well, who is it that's more likely to be obese? It's often lower income individuals. And you may find that paradoxical, you know, some, from the, if you're an alien, you'll say, wait, people with less money are eating more. How is that happening? Well, it's the idea that um, healthy food is increasingly expensive. I mean, even just look at fast food options, right? Look at, look at how hard it is. Um, for those of you, show of hands, is anyone doing a, a keto diet or low carb diet? Anyone? Yeah, so some, yeah. So expensive, yeah. I'm doing low carb right now, and it's like, it's so expensive. You have to shop around if you want, like, you know, and, yeah, and I have to do things that are so bizarre. Like, I go to McDonald's, and I get, I get so I find deals. So, again, I, you know, I'm a student mentality still. So I, I at McDonald's, I get um, a double hamburger with an extra beef patty and no bun and extra onions, extra pickles, and no ketchup, and that's like three bucks. But and then I'm like, I'm like, Oh, one day I did that every day, and then I was like, I've eaten like 15 little McDonald's beef patties. I don't know what I'm doing to myself. <laughs> so, and then I'm like, but this is healthy because I'm not eating the bun. And then it's so, so anyway, and then I was like, you know, if I had a lot of money, I could just go to a nice restaurant, but then it's like, I'm spending $20 on a lunch for like some steamed vegetables and, you know, allegedly better meat. Um, it's very expensive everywhere you go. And once you see it, it's just so oh, everything is fried, donuts, you know, 400 calories of donut costs a dollar, 400 calories of meat is like 15. Um, sorry, so what were you going to say again? Yeah. Yeah. Right. If you get anything keto, so keto is, is, is uh, the state of ketosis, so having, um, almost no, having no sugar and almost no carbs, it's extremely expensive um, to eat that way. Uh, the reason why carbs are so prevalent everywhere is because they're cheap. Just look, look around you uh, how much bread there is uh, uh, in almost everywhere, pastries and whatever. They have long shelf lives. And Anyway, I'm not trying to indoctrinate you into, into keto. Um, but but that, is, <laughs> that is something. I could be wrong. My friend, the same friend at Harvard, says, no, it's high carb. You need to eat plant-based foods. So everything's always uh, people debating. But um, the point of this is obesity, many people in the past said, how, how are the poor uh, larger? Um, and then it's, well, things like chips, hot dogs, all of these things that don't cost very much versus, you know, if you want a nice lean dinner somewhere, um, that's much more expensive. Um, and then obesity is a pressing issue as its rates are increasing around the quote-unquote developed world and have been for, for quite some time. Um, and again, you'll see tons of books, the keto revolution, all, there's tons of diets, some of which post hoc are seen as fads, um, but, but weight is a big issue right now. Um, just people trying to figure out, you know, how do we keep the population healthy without having enormous food budgets, because um, it's really, really expensive um, to try to follow a lot of the trends. Um, so lastly, just theoretical perspectives on disabilities. Again, I've talked about these, so um, functionalism, um, Parsons' sick role is often used here. So again, medicalization of disabilities can be good um, in the sense that, okay, I've now said you have a thyroid issue or you have depression. Um, you can now be treated as sick and your, Ill, and your pains can be seen as legitimate and you can be treated. Conflict theorists, they wouldn't disagree with that necessarily, but they would say that we need to focus on the fact that lower income individuals and minorities and women tend to be experiencing more health problems. Um, so this means that um, this means that there are structural inequalities playing into health that often are missed if you're just looking at it as a kind of functional thing. Um, and then symbolic interactionists, as usual, are interested in the everyday experience of disability. Um, and so they're more interested in the labeling aspect of it. So 
again, conflict theorists and functionalist theorists take two different stances of kind of labeling as being good or labeling as being bad. Symbolic interactionists see, okay, to what extent does labeling actually shape anyone's uh, experiences of health? Um, so there, there's a great book I read that was called The End of Stigma, and, and it was a, like a symbolic interactionist sociologist who studied um, what the conflict theorists, they were talking about disability advocacy groups, and they were talking about how, um, in this book, how many people were reclaiming disability and reclaiming labels, um, kind of getting the best of both worlds in a way. Um, so, so moving beyond the binary of sick and health and saying, no, I'm, I'm, I'm a differently abled person. I'm not stigmatized with this. I have a different kind of vantage point of the world. Um, so there's lots of interesting things going on uh, in the field of health, aging, and disability. Um, and I'm sorry to, to cut it a bit short. Um, but if you have any questions, so hopefully you all stick around for the study session. Um, so yeah, so we're going to have... Um, so we're going to have a 10-minute break uh, while they set up, and I've made the, the next video live, so we'll have that playing in the background. So I'll still be talking to you, um, as you'll see in this new video. OK. Oops. See, new format. You know how long it took me to do that? Well, actually, not, not that long, but it's, it was, it's longer than it should, but OK. So I'll see you guys, in, we'll see you in 10 minutes. Hopefully you can all stick around. We're going to do this. Like, we don't have that much time. This is very loud. Yeah, just turn it off. Yes, please. Yes. So that should be fine. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah, OK. So my name's Ujwal. OK, for people who can't pronounce it, that's Wonderwall. Take the wonder way, put Uj over there. Yeah, never works. But I am the VP academics of the students of sociology, which you guys have never heard of, which is wonderful. Um, we basically are trying to help you guys in any way we can. And one of the ways we do that is by hosting these review sessions. Now, we only have an hour. We used to have longer. And we're just going to zoom through all the chapters, go through test format, and a little study tips on the side. Sounds good? Now, this is how the format's going to work, OK? So I understand that we probably need to have some kind of interaction going. So I'm going to point. And if you don't want to answer the question, you just don't answer it. I'll point immediately to someone else, OK? And if I can't point, Sarah will point. So let's get this going. First, let's start with test format. Um, you guys know all these details, 1 hour 50 minutes, 5, 10 to 7, uh, 27th February. In case you guys are too lazy to open up the slides, I know I am, you guys can just see it from the slides, 27th February, and yeah. Um, so this is... It's in that dark basement that looks like a Canadian Chamber of Secrets, like that, that one. Do you guys like remember that? Yeah. Okay. At any point, just for the record, during the session, if you do have any questions, just put your hand up, because we're just going to keep going until someone stops us, OK? And it's going to work a lot better if we just keep everyone whispering to a very good bit so everyone can hear, OK? And we're going to have like slides where you'll know you can ask questions. You'll recognize the slides when I tell you. And um, so here is the test format. We have 45 MCQs, each worth 1.5 marks, and eight short answer questions, each worth four marks. We will go through the, each chapter, we'll look at the definitions and the short answer questions that you kind of have to look at. Now, don't take it word for word. If you study just out of this slide, I'll be flattered that you trust me that much, but you most likely will fail. You will need to use this as a starting point, because I do understand, I like how everyone just looked up when I said fail. Um, so you can use this as a starting point. And I know where some people have that like, trouble, like, oh, god, where do I start studying? Yeah, sometimes we don't start studying. This will help you at least find out where the definitions are so you can see where you can go forward, OK? Now, we can immediately start off with social inequality, chapter 7. Now, let's start off with the basic definitions. What are the types of systems we're talking about when it comes to social inequality? Anybody? What, like, what types of systems, like, uh, 
closed, open and closed systems, like oh, closed system like my home country, India, we don't think freely, um, or, or like open systems, like pseudo open systems. So what is the difference between closed and open systems? Any takers? Yeah? Like an open system, like pretty much anyone can participate, like depending on like how much they feel like they should, but a closed system, you just don't have the option of like being able to enter something? Exactly, kind of like that. Open systems are basically on the idea that like, if you want to do something, if you have the merit for it, you can go and do that. You don't have to be worried about these social cues. Closed systems, on the other hand, have caste systems, hierarchical rules, hereditary. If you touch a royal person, your hand will be cut off, like that kind of thing. Does that still happen? If it does, let's not talk about it. Then, um, we also have to look at the theories. But before that, can anyone tell me what blaming the victim and blaming the system is. Who's the victim and who's the system? Anyone? Yeah? Exactly, that makes perfect sense. But in terms of social inequality, like in the context of social inequality, it'd be slightly different because rape is like an isolated event, but social inequality is like, um, for example, when you look at poverty. Yeah, back home, we have many instances where people are like, oh, he's poor, he's not working hard enough. When in reality, I mean, you could also argue that the system to help them get out of their poverty is skewed and stupid, so it doesn't work. So you have those two arguments going on. Yeah? Do you guys get what I'm trying to say? And, well, you have to understand that when we talk about social inequality and how it's divided, there is an emphasis on Canadian examples because that's all the textbook seems to talk about. Yeah, that's whitewashed. But yes, we, you will have to focus on the Canadian examples in the textbook. It's pretty straightforward. If you look at social inequality, it's kind of everywhere. I mean, unless you have like AirPods, then you can't see broke. So uh, that's there. Um, but what are the components of inequality and what factors affect it? This is kind of intuitive. Well, yep. Well, I would say one of the biggest ones would be like access to education and just resources. Exactly. Like the whole idea, access to education and access to resources, especially like if you live in the middle of nowhere, no matter how intelligent you are, you're not going to get as far as a person who lives in the hub of all the education and everything that happens. Yeah, it's kind of unfair. But moving on, what about global inequality? What is global inequality? Okay, remember, we're taking inequality, which usually affects people. Now we're taking it to the global level, like we're giving it a new stage. And we're talking about countries, unequal countries. Like there are countries in the global south and global, I pointed upwards for south, global south and global north. And how are these countries different? Like, yeah? Well, I would say in terms of you know, infrastructure and just like overall development. Exactly. Like, for example, if you look at the global south, like countries like <laughs> India and uh, other wonderful candidates, um, we don't have proper organizational structures and like systems put in place. And um, not to, like, it's not like we're like pointing fingers at anyone, like Britain, um, but we have issues. And then you can look into those kinds of things with post-colonial theory and other theories and look into how these systems are put in place to make the global south and global north as unequal as they are. Let's move on to short answer questions, shall we? And, uh, okay, so you guys are all familiar with the classical theories and contemporary theories, right? Yeah, it's like, they're literally the foundation of this subject. So, um, how most of the things that we're gonna be discussing, okay, bye-bye. Most of the things we're gonna be discussing is how conflict theory, functionalist theory, and symbolic interactionism, classical, and the contemporary theories affect the chapters we're dealing with. So can anyone tell me how a conflict theorist would talk about social inequality? And because it's Marx, I will allow you to scream the answer out as he would. Anyone? You seem to, I pointed, yes. No, no, yes, yes. Sorry about counterintuitive signals. Okay. And how um, the systems of inequality are designed so that the top one person will benefit from it and the other people will suffer. That is or as Marx would call it, the rich people are kind to kill us, yeah, like that. So Marx has the whole bourgeoisie and proletariat thing going on. Proletariat are, I mean, I've never actually, I've, he probably, what? 
yeah, proletariat, workers and regular people. But have you ever like, actually seen Marx talk about one guy and say he's bourgeoisie? Hmm, that's actually something that you guys can think about. So bourgeoisie and proletariat, these kind of faceless organisms that are supposed to be this entire class struggle between, oh, we're trying to work, but they're not letting us like, get as far as we could because of the institutions they set in place. Yeah, everyone page with me. How would a functionalist talk about social inequality? Anyone? Yeah. 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 She saw her hand. Yeah. Yeah, functionalists are like, yeah, I don't like functionalists. They just seem so like calm about everything. I mean, in any case, they want to. Uh, they have this idea that everything that does happen has this kind of purpose, like you know, like an organism, like a human body. That even e inequality kind of. It happens because we're not uh, distributing resources properly or everyone's not getting their right stay. But it's also that you know, some people just can't be as equal to others. And I'm not saying this in terms of race or anything, but in terms of if you give everyone a certain job, then other jobs will suffer. Like Everyone's position contributes to what they do in society. And now let's move on to the other theories. And if you want to think about, actually we'll be coming to these theories throughout the whole um, session. And the idea with these theories is that they're not actually like, how do you put it, different for each topic. They're like a way of looking at things. And you'll find that the moment you kind of get a grasp on them, you can talk about anything through any of these theories, which is actually very convenient. Now, this is one thing that, um, I have been told to remind you guys constantly, and I've made sure to, if you see the rest of my slides. Guys, answer all the questions. Uh, apparently some of you guys leave some of the questions blank, and I mean, there's not really much of a point in that. I mean, there's no negative marking. And honestly, just write what you get. Like back in my dad's day, his friends used to write Bollywood lyrics in their biology paper because he just wanted to fill up the page. Granted, the education system was screwed back then, but it's not any better now, no. <laughs> No one's looking. No one's going to worry if you look stupid in the paper. They already know that the system arbitrarily designing grades to judge your wa value is stupid enough. So just write answers. Write all of them. I will remind you again so you can forget this time. We're going to talk about gender. Yeah, we're going to speed through these things. Okay, does anyone have questions about social inequality first? Yeah? If you guys have any questions, you can send mails because this is going to be on the... Um, on Quarkus, and I'll be sure to like introduce any notes and new things we discussed that you sh you guys should probably remember going in. Gender, gender, gender has come into the spotlight recently for good measure. Now that it's a spectrum, now the idea is that you, what is the difference between sex and gender? Yep. Uh, sex is you know like your biological, like how you're born, like male or female, but then gender is how you um, like how you identify as. Yeah, exactly. Sex is, well, this might be a crude way of putting it, but sex is the outside, gender is the inside. And what is the difference between intersex and transgender? Anyone? Yep. And then they transition. Yeah, exactly. So that's perfect. We have the idea that um, so intersex starts off at a certain point, transgender starts out later, like when you grow into your sex, whereas intersex is when you are born with both sexual organs. And uh, okay, now this is a nice question that has been mentioned probably throughout every chapter. What is hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity? Hegemonic masculinity. Okay, let the girls answer this one. You know, you just dig into it and yeah. Criticize us, yep. Uh, so it's the um, kind of notion of masculinity that's everywhere around us, and so this image of the hyper masculine dude who is very manly, and so this image that's repeated everywhere, and um, all men are kind of looking up to it and want to be that. 
See, the fact that she's used the word manly, which even though it reframes the question, we know exactly what she's talking about. We're imagining this huge Chad and uh, like just, just walking everywhere, exuding testosterone. So that's, that's, that is how hegemonic masculinity thinks. And it's not good for people. Like it, there's a reason the suicide rates are so high in men, is because when we can't go up to that ideal, all the stories say that we need to die on our swords or something like that. It's weird. Emphasize femininity, on the other hand, is like, okay, no swords for you, take the needle. What is emphasize femininity? Like, any takers? Yeah. Or, what? Well, let them, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you. Uh, like, that's kind of like the idea that you condition girls to, you know, do like the, the quote unquote, like girly type stuff, like, you know, clean the house, and like learn to cook, things like that, like things that are associated with feminine, like, like, being feminine and, you know, homeless type stuff. Exactly. And that, that really causes problems because the idea that w women can only do certain things when they're actually pretty much, I, I, can't, I still can't think of one thing that women can't do, except perhaps like have a penis, but okay. Oh, wait. That in gender, now that it's a spectrum, that's another argument. Hidden curriculum and chilly climate. Can any of you tell me what the difference between hidden curriculum and chilly climate is? Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. The I, yep. You got it perfectly right. The idea that you know women actually kind of feel it, the reason they use chilly climate is the whole, the whole idea of the cold shoulder. The idea that you know women feel like their answers are not respected as much in schools and classes. Now here we go on to what is the gender the gender labor force and the gendered labor force. What is the idea of a gendered labor force that only certain jobs can go to certain genders? Exactly. And what about the wage gap? Can anyone tell me about the wage gap? Yeah, it's ridiculous. Like, what, society tends to give men more money for the same job that they perform as women, and they have ridiculous arguments to support it. It's the same job, but women are not getting paid the same. And now, what, and now feminization. The, this touches into feminist theory, so we can move on to the short theory answer questions. Can anyone tell me and compare feminist and post-structuralist theories on gender? What's the fundamental idea behind feminist theory? Equality. Equality between the genders. And what is the feminist uh, fundamental idea behind post-structuralist theory? Yeah, no one knows. But we're trying to understand it. Post-structuralist theory apparently talks about, in, through literary analysis, the idea that there are no labels and that we're like, there are structures in society, the things that we look at, like uh, who, what, what a man is, what a woman is, or what marriage is, or any of those kinds of things. And we break those labels down, destructure them, and that we're living in a post-structuralist age where those labels don't mean anything anymore. And how can hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity become constraining? Yep. Well, because like, you feel like you have to live up to these you know, certain expectations when maybe you don't want to. Like, maybe you could be a guy who wants to go into nursing. But you know, like, that's just feel dominated by women. You feel you know, out of place, like you don't belong. Exactly. And especially, for example, um, I find that, <laughs> for example, I'm in a creative writing class. And we have so many women in that class, it's like amazing, and I have great stories, but the teacher is a man. Now, this is just an isolated incident, and this doesn't happen regularly, but you can see how, from the past generation, it, it is that much of the teaching force and the workforce and politicians are men, for that matter. And women, on the other hand, are pushed towards roles that you know, they're traditionally supposed to do, or expected to do. And 
we also have to talk about the feminist and post-structuralist views on gender. The idea that now since gender is now a spectrum, the original label of gender only being two genders does not apply anymore. Because now we have to understand and identify the many different people who are coming forward and understanding that their uh, gender is not what they were identified as birth or anything else. You guys with me? Now, provide three examples of how families have an influence on reproducing gender. Yeah? Well, I, mean, uh, I would say that maybe depending on what uh, sex you were born, like, you tend to cling towards that and you find more like, say for me as a, as a boy, like, I would always help my dad with the car and you know, the things I got to do, cutting the grass and shoveling the snow while well, my sister would be inside helping my mom to make lunch or doing laundry or things like that. Yeah. I. Uh, Exactly. And I have a vivid memory of trying to like, back. I, I come from a conservative family and I was trying to go into the kitchen to cook and my grandmother threw me out of the kitchen and then finally my dad convinced her to let me cook in the kitchen Then I burnt the rotis and I never cooked again. But the idea is that it's kind of ingrained in our family like, systems and ideas that, you know, boys are not supposed to do these things or girls are not supposed to do these things. And then there's also the gendered birthday cakes, the pink and blue ones. Yeah, that, it's, it's cute, I guess, the Instagram videos, but it still is a way of propagating this unseen um, hegemonic masculinity and emphasized femininity. Now, again, <laughs> so we're back to this slide again. Answer all the questions, guys. Like this, yeah, if you've not uh, got on the train right now, this slide's going to come back every three slides. Uh, so please answer all the questions, whatever you have in your mind, just put it on the paper. Trust me, it's worth it. Now, let's move on to sexualities, okay? Uh, let's talk about a few common misconceptions. What is heterosexism and how is it different from homophobia? Yeah, the idea that, like, um, for example, it's not, it's people, it's those people who said, oh, I'm not homophobic, and then, you know, go home and make those birthday cakes. Like, the idea that there can only be two genders, and the idea that they propagate the belief that there's only one kind of sexuality, the heteronormative ideal. Even, for example, uh, uh, there, this was a story that, uh, uh, one of my professors used to say how, and she's a lesbian, and she used to go to this, she went to a nurse, and uh, it was ticked over there that, um, do you use um, protection while you have sex? And she said no. And then um, the next question was, uh, is there a chance that you might be pregnant? And she's like, no. And the nurse started assaulting her, saying, what, how, how can you be sure that you are not going to be pregnant if you don't use protection? And she's like, well. So the, the idea, heteronormativity, which is propagated in schools and other institutions, is a form of what we call heterosexism, which is opposed to outright hatred for the sexu other sexualities, which is homophobia. Now, what are key negative points in current sex education? This kind of ties into the previous question. Apart from the fact that in most places sex education does not happen, what are the key negative points in most kinds of sex education? Yeah. It, it, it misses out so much on the spectrum. People don't understand what's going on with their um, sexualities because they're never told in school and their parents don't talk to them. And yeah? I mean, like, uh, I, I could say like, it, it focuses more on like, the actual like, intercourse like, factor of it. But you know, some people may not want that. I know there's uh, like, pansexual, like they're not free schools, right? Like, where they're not, they, they don't want to like, have intercourse, but they still want like, you know, companionship kind of. Oh, that's asexual. Asexual. Pansexuals are attracted to all kinds of sexualities. Yeah. Whereas asexuals uh, do not have any uh, sexual desire whatsoever. Um, what is the difference between non-monogamy and polygamy? 
this is kind of, I was confused by this myself because, I mean, monogamy and poly poly polygamy seem like direct opposites. Like, you either want to be with a lot of people or you want to be with one person. But that's not the case. What is non-monogamy and poly? Like, polygamy is to be with many partners. And non-monogamy is to not be with one partner. So what's the way this works out? Yeah? Maybe like if I, um, I'm, I'm pretty sure like polygamy like is when you, like you're engaged to them, you have like an open relationship, and the other one is you're not engaged, you're just, just out there. Kind of. The thing is, polygamy is mostly that it's one person with many sexual partners, or many partners in general. Uh, Non-monogamy, well, I mean, if you've ever been in a relationship before and that relationship didn't work out, um, sorry, um, then you, and if you plan to get in a relationship again, then you are technically a serial non-monogamist because you will, it's, it's that you are not maintaining one sexual partner through your life. You're having multiple. It's just not like in different time streams, which is, yes? Yep. But, like, but I never had sex or something. Like, does that still count? Um, that's a good question. I'm actually going to go to the professor for that. If yeah, so, serial, serial, uh, having like a string of partners, if, if they each start after the breakup, uh, that would be serial monogamy. So each relationship was monogamous, meaning like one person, mono right. whatever, um, monogamous person, <laughs> uh, getting into Latin. Um, but if, if whether it was sexual or not, uh, so as long as you you considered it a romantic, it's more about the, the romantic relationship, the partnership. Um, serial non-monogamy would be if you um, increase, if, if in every seemingly two-person relationship you have, um, that you cheat on them, or that you set the ground rules of saying, actually, we're open, or I'm going to be with other people. Um, and then polygamy is more, um, it's, so the key difference between non-monogamy and polygamy is oftentimes non-monogamy works one way. Um, so a person who's non-monogamous might say, like, I'm going to be with other people, or they'll keep it hidden. That's like the cheater. Um, a, polygamous, a polygamy refers more to the relationship. Um, so if you're in a polygamous relationship, that means you're open. If you're into polygamy, it means you're into being with multiple partners, um, and you're into other people that are into multiple partners. Um, so they're similar, but the key idea is, as Ishmael said at the beginning, um, uh, non-monogamy is more. Um, oh, <laughs> um, non-monogamy is more about uh, you making this choice uh, that you uh, are going to be with other people, and polygamy is more about the, the actual webs of relationships themselves. Okay. Here we are back, we're done with sexualities, and we're back over here. So um, let's do some image identification. Can anyone tell me who those lovely ladies are? Yeah, you don't have image identification on the test. I mean, like, that, that, that would be a very interesting test. Now, who are these lovely ladies, okay? And does anyone have any idea? That is bell hooks, yes. Yep, Dorothy Smith and bell hooks. And what did they talk about? Exactly. And could you tell us about that? <laughs> I'm loving the enthusiasm. Exactly. First wave, uh, for, for context for the people who didn't hear that, second wave feminism, as contrasted to first wave feminism, fe first wave feminism gave women the right to vote. Yeah, that was a historic landmark. And then it moved on when women realized, okay, we can vote, vote, but we're not doing anything. 
and we're not getting anything done because they, we still have so many institutions that are not letting us. So second wave feminism allowed people, uh, women, the right to get, uh, it started the argument for the wage gap and got people to work. But then it was mostly focused on white women. Third wave feminism, as Bell Hooks talked about it, opened up the horizons and talked about other women of other races and other sexualities and other cultures. And thus, the cycle was not complete. I mean, it was complete, but we still have issues to work out. And again, answer all the questions, guys. The answer's in there somewhere. Just get it out in the paper. Trust me, it's worth it. Now we go on to race and racialization. Does anyone have any questions on sexualities? No? Okay. Now we go on to, okay, can anyone tell me about critical race theory? Yeah, and how is it different from post-colonial theory? It's like a thin line. Yes, I heard that oh God over there. Yes, we will discuss that again when we go to religion. Yes, okay. Switcher, yeah, no? Okay. I mean, you can give it a try. Exactly. Colonization. Like, you know, how um, basically how the West was mean to us. Um, so post-colonial theory focuses on the countries like in the West, like Britain and France and most of Europe, and how they decided to come over to our... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm passionate about this topic. How they decided to come over to the Global South and take... I was going to say our land again. Um, the, how they decided to in, put things in place which not only affected us, gave them resources, but set us back many years. Racism, on the other hand, is more of a microsocial, but it can also be macrosocial. The idea about how one race thinks of itself as superior to another race. This has been seen, for example, in uh, North America with uh, things like Jim Crow laws, which uh, Jim Crow laws and basic racism and segregation that happened in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, which really discriminated against it, you know, um, African-American people. Um, with the First Nation people and um, the whole residential schools. And it, it would be important for you guys to remember that because considering the fact that for the people who are Canadian, that's an important part of their culture. Now, what is, um, we can go on to talk about the social construction of race, racialization, but I want to talk about that through the theories. So, oh, wait, we should probably also talk about what the difference between a race and an ethnicity is. Yeah? So, race could be something like the area you're from, the region, like from the skin color that you want, if you're actual and biological makeup. Yeah. But ethnicity could be like how you identify with, because I mean, like, like, say, like you could be, you know, uh, like, you know a, a black person, but you could still be, you know, like, like you would identify like you know, you're Canadian, you're, you know, Western, you know, et cetera. Kind of. Sarah, you want to take this one? Uh, oh, she's not allowed to give course content. That's an interesting, yeah? What is race and what is ethnicity? I heard cultural just being whispered, yeah, okay. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, race is biological, and the idea of the sim uh, similarities between um, physical characteristics like um, the things that white people share, are you know, their Aryan characteristics, and, um, but ethnicity focuses mostly on social cultural distinctions, like laws, customs, traditions, and ideas. And, and, and I mean, even like the category of race, it's being critiqued a lot, like on biological grounds, like whether it's real or not. Um, so in this class, it's more, um, you know, just pushing that all into like sociology. Race is usually seen as an ascribed kind of fixed characteristic. So like whether it's biological or not, your race is pretty much what it is at birth for your whole life, um, uh, whereas your ethnicity is active. Um, so I think in the lecture I said race is more structuring and, ethnic and uh, ethnicity is more full of agency. 
Um, so myself, for example, um, you know, I'll pretty well always identify as white my whole life, um, regardless of what that is, even though I have a, you know, I have a lot of different things, that's kind of my race. Um, but my ethnicity, kind of, uh, I alternate between sometimes feeling more like I'm a Torontonian and other times feeling more Trinidadian, um, just, you know, depending on what kind of food I want to eat and where I want to spend my winters. Um, but no, no, in all seriousness, ethnicity is usually more, um, it's the more dynamic. Uh, um, an example of how uh, like ethnicity is like a contested topic would probably be like um, how many of you watched The Daily Show by Trevor Noah? Hmm, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I mean it's fun. You you see it when you're like, yeah, it comes now and then. Trevor Noah actually got in trouble with the French embassy for uh, saying that Africa won the World Cup when France won the World Cup because most of uh, France's team are African French. Um, France got ballistic. He's like, oh, um, he did the French accent. I'm not going to. Um, he, uh, apparently, um, all the people in the team identify as French and they're known by their French identity. But does being French make you less African? Like, I mean, you identify with both ethnicities, which is why, in one way, that's one good thing that America did one good thing that America did uh, is that you know you can share your dual identity or even many more identities. You can be Africa, you can be um, Indian American, no American, yeah Indian American and uh, African American and so on. Now, um, can you tell me the difference between stereotype and uh, prejudice? It's not on, but should be yeah. Exactly. Like, um, how, um, so a stereotype would be this whole idea that like Asians are like good at math. And um, I hate to be the, uh, I hate to break the news to you, we're not. Um, but, and prejudice would be the idea that you expect this person to behave in a certain side, uh, type of way because of your preconceived notions. And um, Yes, we should also talk about how prejudice versus discrimination, especially the ecological and exception fallacy. This is very important. Okay, uh, fallacy is something that's gone wrong. And what is the ecological fallacy? Can you make an assumption about a group based on an individual? Yes, and I, the exception fallacy is the exam. So an ecological fallacy is when you make an assumption about a group based on an individual. Like if I see a random Indian walk by and I'm like, oh my God, they all walk like that. Um, we do, but uh, and exception fallacy is if when you see a group, you make an assumption about an individual, or when you have these preconceived notions about a group. Um, so, and there are fallacies because they're pretty untrue. Like if you think about a, a, a person and you try to generalize to the whole group, you're alienating a whole group of individuals, and that's how racism basically starts. Now we also have to look into the ideas of Canadian minorities, and let's look at this through the theories. Especially, um, can anyone tell me what the Quiet Revolution was? Yeah, don't worry, I don't know either. I'm going to go to the professor on this. So, professor, the Quiet Revolution. One of you must know. Oh. Oh, she, can, she knows, but she can't tell us. She just wanted to make sure that she knows. Yeah. Yeah, but we need more context. Yeah? Yes. So um, it was the contested idea of the identity of being Quebecois in the fact that they're you know, the French and in Canada and how it was a lot of friction that came about of the whole thing. Um, I'm not exactly sure what the revolution was, though. You can give one answer. Okay. <laughs> I want to keep it student-focused. Okay, thank you. This is like my problem yeah. in class. Yeah, she knows it. <laughs> um, so the choir revolution was, I believe, the first time uh, Quebec attempted to separate They were trying to get a part of us, and that was due to the fact that they did not feel that they, they felt more French than they did Canadian. 
Um, and they do want to follow some of the Canadian laws that are enforced under them, like they must include both English and French. They just want to distribute French. And this was their quiet evolution of them coming together peacefully. Peacefully. Um, <laughs> and mobilizing in order for them to come to the government and say, we have a majority of us want to leave and become our own distinct country within the border. Well, Quebec wants to become some country. And it never almost happened. Yeah, it always happened, and then we didn't, and then it always happened again, and then yeah. But the first time, there was a lot of opposition between Canada, and Canada was like, please, we'll do whatever you want, just please don't leave. And the second time, Canada was like, okay, you can do what you want. And they probably said that really politely because it's Canada. See, now, that, that is a stereotype, but it's a good stereotype. I mean, can there be good stereotypes? That's an argument we have to discuss. Um, multiculturalism and the melting pot. Now, this sounds the same. Well, it doesn't sound at all the same, but it kind of, you, you think that this means the same thing. But what is the difference between multiculturalism and a melting pot? Yeah? Well, I would say like multiculturalism is kind of the idea where like different subcultures can exist like, you know, across like an area. But the melting pot would be like, well, okay, if you're part of, you know, Canada, like you have to associate with the Canadian identity, like you have to start eating Canadian food, start doing Canadian, Exactly. And this is one of the big arguments that come from even the whole idea of Brexit. The British were just getting irritated, you know, that foreigners came into their land and they're bringing their food and they're bringing their people. Hmm, it's almost like someone else did that first. But yeah, so the whole idea of melting pot is a bit more forced than multiculturalism, whereas multiculturalism is more of this uh, symbiotic kind of cohesion of religions. Okay, and again, hey guys, in case you forgot, image identification. Who is that Squidward with glasses over there? The other guy. Yes, and what did he talk about? Uh, uh, this is what? Huh? Oh, okay, yeah. Functionalism. Functionalism. Okay. Yeah. Emil Durkheim um, was this um, guy who just believed in... Can anyone actually tell me about what functionalism stands for? What is its basic... Like, if it had, like, a slogan, what would it be? Like, everything has, uh, like, a reason to, like, to be there, like, the functions are everything can just keep moving smoothly. Exactly. Everything gets to work together. Like, you know, everything has a reason to be there, and people have to just subscribe to that reason. And now let's move on to families. Anyone have any questions with uh, race and racialization? Families. Now, uh, yeah, that, that is an ideal family, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, babies are noisy, but dogs, who doesn't like dogs? A cat. Yeah. A cat. And a cat, just to not alienate the few people who might like cats. Okay, can someone tell me, uh, quick, let's go through the definitions of family, okay? And um, this is how we do it. Um, if it's, hold up the typical number of uh, members that this family might have like okay a nuclear family how many people could it possibly have four yeah a mother father and maybe two children yeah um, an extended family well what could it cons you know constitute yeah I'm sure like um, I'm sure that like when you look at your own family, you can see that it's the difference between extended and like domestic. So what's a domestic family? Yeah? Yeah. Um, okay, how, how do I put this? Can you tell me the difference between extended family and domestic family? Exactly. Yeah, domestic family goes into the whole idea of like marriage and the institution, but it also talks about people who all live under one roof, like huge families that live under one roof. Is, is that what the course talks about, domestic families? Like we don't focus as much on domestic, but yeah, domestic is more, I mean, just sort of being around a domicile. So it's more about the shared residence within. Um, but based on, as you're saying, or it's it's like it's an extension of the nuclear family in some cases of like the classic like uh, biological parents, um, but not as big as the extended. So yeah, it's it's kind of 
almost in between um, nuclear and extended in a way. But it's not as much a focus for us here. It's more nuclear and extended. And then you, it's, I um, highlighted Eichler's definition of family. Um, this is important for you guys to remember, and you should probably look into using this as a starting point when you're trying to talk about families. Now, marriage and divorce, um, well, this is pretty straightforward. Marriage is um, the accepted form of union of two or more people that is found in many cultures around the world. Divorce, relatively new well, not too new concept, is the idea of the fact, the idea that that marriage can be split up, yeah? And, um, okay, can anyone tell me what rolled strain is and provide an example? It especially happens in the case of working women who have to both balance their duties as mothers or perhaps uh, um, whatever emphasized femininity says that they owe to their husbands and at the same time manage their professional capacity. This causes strain which leads to a variety of issues. And uh, we also have to look at this through the three classical theories. Now, we're not using the main guys like Emil Durkheim and Mar you know, Karl Marx. We're using different people. Functionalism goes to Talcott Parsons, conflict theory to Frederick Engels, symbolic interactionism to Goffman, and the three contemporary theories are the queer, feminist, and post-structuralist. Can anyone tell me what Tal Talcott Parsons said about uh, marriage? Yeah, what, what he said about marriage and the idea of, uh, and families, yeah. Come on, yeah. Just, just, okay. I mean, when you're thinking about functionalism, just get into the role of like a hippie and just talk about like, oh yeah, peace, love, compassion, and then just think about what would a family look like in that kind of context. Like, well, Talcott Parsons did mention all about how families were centers that, you know, were important for society because they were places where humans could go to, no, it's okay, yeah, you, you want to, you, you want to talk about, no, 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 okay, okay, yeah, so, so, Yeah, exactly. How did Frederick Engels talk about mar marriage and families? I know especially we had actually this in the other course. Uh, how did he talk about the whole idea of family? Well, as most conflict theorists, he had well issues with it, like they do with everything. Families, he believed, were uh, also systems of, you know, imp uh, oppression, especially with the case of like how the woman and how she, she is not allowed to basically fulfill her duties because she's expected to do certain things and be part of a certain system. And uh, yes, this is important. Family of origin and family of procreation. What's the difference between that? Yeah? Family of origin. Can any, anyone have any idea? Yeah, just 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 wing it like origin and procreation. Yeah. Yeah. No, you? Okay. You're you're on the spot. <laughs> Exactly. 
country of origin, and if you happen to like claim some uninhabited, an uninhabited land, you become the country of procreation. That sounds. If I turn, if I turn socially agree into an island, then um, I won't be involved in the procreation one, but I'll yeah. set you guys up. It's like Lord of the Flies. Anyway, okay. That. Yeah, this was secretly all just a giant mixer. Um, okay, hey guys. Maybe for, for sake of time, should, can we do the multiple choice and then come back to the Sure, choice? yes. Yeah. Um, that's Karl Marx. Um, okay, angry Einstein. I think you guys are going to get a bit tired, so we'll, um, the multiple choice will jazz you up because it's you know, right or wrong, whatever. Um, the rest also, of the chapters, we have the same thing. So. Also, just, I just want to point out, health, aging, and disabilities, that's Ash Ketchum because he does not age, get bad, or have any disabilities. Yes, he's wonderful. Okay. okay. Before we start this, I am gone with the luck of the rest of the review session. I Everyone wish good luck to Sarah. She has a chemistry exam today. Yeah, we are. We are. <laughs> Everyone's going to need it. Don't get caught cheating. Don't get caught cheating. Thanks so much. Good luck. See ya. Well, okay. Let's uh, run through these multiple choice questions. Okay. And so I'm going to. Uh -huh. So, you guys can shout out the answers. Shout out the answers, guys. Horschel uh, coined this term in reference to the domestic labor performed by employed women at home after finishing their paid work days. Okay. Okay. Is it consensus? Is it okay? How about this? A, raise your hand. B, raise your hand. Okay, we just run through this fast. A. B. Do I have to go to C? B is the right answer. B is the right answer. Why is it the right answer? Second shift. It's in the name. The idea that women have to do another set of work. We know that one set of work is called a shift, so second shift. And it's not called pink ghetto and pink work. Pink ghetto is the most badass term I've ever heard in a while. Like, okay. Someone suffering from stress. Yeah. Someone suffering from stress due to not having adequate time or resources, and um, what is this an example of, this whole thing called? Yeah? We've just discussed this. Um, a, B, C, D, E, yeah, B. B is the answer. It's role strain. The idea that they have this role that they have to perform, and it's causing them issues. It's straining them, and yeah. Which of the following illustrates a workplace assuming ex employees experience no conflict between their work and family lives? Yeah? Okay. Who's up for A? B? Okay. A. B. So which one, make, which one assumes no role conflict between work and family? A daycare that allows people to bring children to work, an entrepreneur, um, that starts their business on top of their regular job and they order a lot of takeout. A law firm requiring everyone to learn work late, preparing for an important trial. Or someone choosing that she'd like to spend a lot of time at her home with her young. So which one is assuming no conflict? Let's eliminate answers, okay? Conf a, we can eliminate immediately because they're literally a, a daycare developing policy. They're literally allowing parents who have like kids at home to leave their kids at some place so they can work better. Yeah, that, that immediately assumes that that takes off so much strain from them. Second, B, um, he, he's starting a business and they uh, order a lot of takeout so their employees, who are obviously going to have to work longer hours, will have something to eat. So it assumes no conflict. Um, D, yeah, C is the answer. It's mainly because, I mean, if you've seen this TV show Suits, then you do know, you, you kind of know how... Maniacal it is. D is, um, you know, choosing part-time jobs that allow them to work from home, you know, to spend a lot of time with children when they're young. Yeah? Okay, moving on. In what ways have queer theories argued that the design of suburban houses can be seen as heteronormative? Yeah? Can anyone tell me why it's C? So the reason why it can be C when some people can even think it's B, 
kitchens tend to be decorated in feminine ways. I don't know exactly what this question is trying to tell us, because if anything, d design is something that changes from person to person, and it can be changed. But on the other hand, the architectural plan which makes a master bedroom cannot assumes from the beginning that there are going to be one couple in that bedroom, and there's no idea for poly polygamy or polyamory or any of that kind of thing. Which of the following is not true of social reproduction? Yeah, A, B, C, D, yeah, anyone? So this is one of the ones where you want to think, okay, if everything was obvious to people all the time, why would we be studying sociology, right? So with that in mind, which answer do you think it is? It's, it, A, it's performed by the family. So again, it's something that's not true of social reproduction. It's, no, it's performed by the family. Well, it is, so that is true, so that's wrong. It's essential to the capitalist economy. That, yeah, it is essential. Um, it ensures the general, the generational reproduction of the population, yes. D, it's, re it's recognized by individuals as one of the primary functions of the family. No, because when you think of the family, do you think, oh yes, the family is essential to social reproduction. Uh, we're reproducing the norms and everything. We wouldn't have a weak on education and socialization if that was the case. I'd be happy to <laughs> Yeah, everyone. There's all these questions like this. This is like the, when I had the Lawrence's narcissistic holiday lottery, this is like the sociology narcissistic question. It's like, yeah, you're learning this in sociology. So. I don't have that many questions like that. It's kind of a more, yeah. you know, it's not solid questions. By stressing societal norms and values and by working to socialize next generations, formal and informal education both contribute to social. One trick that's actually very useful that I find when I'm looking at MCQ choice questions is to look at the previous questions, because for some reason, often times you find the answer in the previous ones, such as in this case. Yes, social reproduction. There you go. And you have to rule out too, because we're not talking about a specific society, right? So if we were talking, like it can't be something super specific. So it can't be inequality, because what if you're talking about a society that's actually very equal and that they learn those as norms? But it's always going to be contributing to social reproduction, because by definition, families are reproducing society. So that's, um, you know, sometimes things aren't as tricky or whatever as they seem. Uh, Critical race theory. As we've discussed in class, it contributes and uh, it allows us to view contemporary social situations through a lens of... Again, the best answer. So, show of hands, who thinks it's A? Who thinks it's B? Who, who thinks, thinks it's C? C? Yes, C. So, I think of the examples I use in class. I talk about Jim Crow, racial segregation, I, I usually focus on early 20th century America. Um, those other things are all part of it, but the core thing they talk about is how racism is embedded into uh, American society or whatever society they're living. Yeah. Again, you want the core thing, the most like central thing. All of them are technically true, but that's the most true. Now using that same ideology, how do you answer this question? Early feminist teachings and education addressed issues of And we're talking about early feminist teachings. Best one. What's their, what are they doing like, in this case? Not in general, in this case. What? So B is not the right answer. It is C, sexism embedded in school textbooks. We're talking about uh, early feminist uh, theories of education. So we're going to go back to things like um, second wave feminism and um, the I, idea of equality of the sexes, and it starts out with the idea that you propagate this hegemonic masculinity and emphasize femininity through the textbooks you read, and uh, the lack of representation, and all of that's touched upon. People yeah. weren't even really using the term gender back then. You have to think of the context, right? So if you said in 1950 or whatever, um, oh, there's gender inequality coming out of school, people are going to say, what the heck? 
it's, it's the real, no, it's saying you may think the teachings are accurate, but actually you're portraying men and women in, uh, in very different ways than you're portraying women in a poor life. So again, think, it's practical, right? Think of someone in that time, the question, I mean, this is, this is a harder question, but I, I told you based on the, on the feedback I got from the first uh, uh, study prep, I'm trying to put some that are hard. This is definitely a more challenging one. They're not all gonna be like this, but when you see ones like this, okay, think of the moment, and it's, it should be the one that is most obvious at that point. Gender inequalities is too vague, too. Um, so it's just, why, why am I gonna, then, and then I can say that about everything that feminists do, right? So it's not that that's too broad, so. Uh, one thing that sociologists have the privilege of doing is being the memory. We get to remember timelines that don't exist anymore and, you know, understand how we can not propagate and make the mistakes that we did before. But often we just end up remembering the mistakes that are made right now. Um, early feminist teachings in education. Oh, oh, so, okay. I'm done in a minute, and I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm going to start wrapping up. These things are going to be there on Quarkus, but at the same time, we're hosting the same review session again tomorrow, where we'll hopefully have more time. So you guys are welcome to attend. It's going to happen about the same time when class ends tomorrow. And um, if you guys have any questions, you are free to actually contact the SOS, the Students of Sociology. Our office is on the same floor that Lawrence's office is. And um, we're not, we've got a small team, but we work to try and help you guys. And if we have office hours every Wednesday, so if you have any questions, don't feel free to shoot me an email. I will also put the email on the slides with when they go on a Quarkus. Thanks, everybody. Please check the document once it's up. Study tips and everything are up there, too, and I'll make an announcement about that. I figured we wouldn't be able to cover everything um, just because they made spent so much time doing this. Um, so let's give a round of applause to Ujwal. He made this whole presentation. So, excellent. You should be teaching the class, not me. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. You might want to look at the uh, comments. Oh, funny. Yeah.